Father's Arms, nestled in the beautiful foothills of Appalachia in the southeastern United States and northeast Alabama. Our Father's Arms is a place of healing and deliverance. Each day, we turn our hearts toward God's Word. There's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs, one for each day of the month. The proverb for the day provides a springboard and commentary to the rest of Scripture. We invite you to join us as we relax, open our Bibles, and trust Him to speak to our hearts. Proverbs chapter 4. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law that's fulfilled in love. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, Let your heart retain my words, L-E-T, living and expressing truth. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom, get understanding, do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she'll preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and in all of your getting, get understanding. And we know in verse 4, the way you get is you let. We get nothing from God except that which we what? Receive. Receive. 8. Exalt her, feminine gender. First time we see the Holy Spirit in Scripture, like a mother hen brooding over the face of deep there in uh, Genesis 1, about to give birth to creation. The mother heart of God, the Spirit of God who nurtures and guides. And uh, this is a spirit of wisdom. Now exalt her, and she will promote you. She'll bring you honor when you embrace her. Now, when you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. You will not be promoted. You'll be demoted. But when you humble yourself, you will be exalted, and she'll promote you when you embrace her. Now, in order to embrace her, that means I have to let go of everything else I've been embracing. All of my idols, all of the the things and the people I've been looking to to validate me as a human being, and they never can and it never will, and I embrace him who's expressed through her, the Spirit, then uh, there are no other gods before him. And that means I'm really not concerned about what I think other people think of me. I'm only concerned with what I know he knows about me. And that is, I was formerly a self-centered, sin-sick human being, born a crack baby. C-R-A-C-K, corruption and rebellion against Christ's kingdom. Sin nature. We were all born with it. And that's why we embrace everything but Him. Born and bred to be enemies of God Almighty. And then when we get so tired of it and we begin to cry out, we receive the gift of desperation. Somebody was praying for us. And somebody got out of God's way. And then the Lord began to move in and bring us to a place of desperation when we cry out to Jesus and we discover this amazing, life-transforming truth. Jesus loves me, this I know. Do you know? Because when you know, you start embracing wisdom. And you realize, verse 9, she'll place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. Wow. 10. Hear, my son, is that you? Well, if you've received a spirit of adoption whereby you cry, Abba, Father, that is you. God Almighty is your daddy. Not until you receive a spirit of adoption. He's offering to adopt you. Will you adopt him? Will you leave that old uh, uh, desolate, nasty, filthy orphanage? called this world where your needs are not getting met and that you're abused and rejected and and uh, and beaten and deprived and, you know and here is the almighty with a huge glorious luxurious mansion with a banquet table and he said would you come be my child i offer you adoption well don't consider yourself unworthy like those in antioch did 
and forfeit eternal life, you receive that uh, spirit of adoption, and then you'll know you're his son, and you'll receive his sayings. And years of your life will be many, and I've taught you in the way of wisdom, and I've led you in straight paths. And when you walk, your steps will not be hindered. And when you run, you're not going to stumble. You take hold of instruction and do not let go. You keep her, for she's your life. 14. Do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of evil. Avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn away from it and pass on. Now, we know and we're reminded every time we see wicked, we think unbelief. There's nothing more wicked than calling God a liar. Okay, so don't enter the path of the wicked. Hath God really said? Hath God really said? You're not loved. He hadn't paid the sin debt for you. Shame on you. Shame on me. Here's guilt. Here's regret. Here's shame. Receive that. Embrace that. Go with the lie. Never mind the way, the truth, and the life. You see, that's the way of the wicked. Now, what happens when you repent? You start agreeing with God, and when you start agreeing with God, you stop agreeing with God's enemy. And that's what's killing people. And basically, the enemy, the father of lies, is saying you're not loved with a perfect, unfailing love. And therefore, you're driven all your life trying to get it. And, it's, and it can be found nowhere else. Everything else is a mirage. It looks like water out there in that desert, and you get out there to it, and nothing is there. And you die of spiritual thirst until you find a river of living water, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you receive him, and you drink from that fountain. And now your need's being met, and you've got this incredible grace within you that allows you to turn the other cheek and bless those that curse you. And it really doesn't matter if somebody takes from you because you know it's not yours anyway. And you're so fulfilled in your relationship of embracing the Almighty that you delight in surfing the waves of adversity rather than the waves of adversity just crashing upon you and destroying you like it is the masses. And you know goodness and mercy are going to follow you all the days of your life, and you're going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know that. How do you know? I don't know how I know. I just know I know. When I'm embracing her, that means I'm letting go of everything and everyone else. Luke 14, he says, if you're going to be my disciple, King James says you've got to hate. And that word means having indifference toward your father, mother, brother, sister, sons and daughters, and even your own life in comparison to your love for him. And unless you give up all of those things and those people you think are your possessions, you can't be my disciple. Now, we know in, uh, in John 8, if you abide in the Word and the Word abides in you, then indeed you're my disciples and you'll know the truth. And what will the truth do? Truth will set you free. <laughs> so freedom comes from awakening to reality. The truth was the truth is the truth will forever be truth. Me believing truth doesn't make truth true. Truth is. And I tell you, you can look at physical death with a sense of dread and fear and, and uh, shame and, and sadness and and, uh, but if you're doing that, then your portion is in this life. And if your portion's in this life, there's no way you can win. <laughs> you know, go ahead and have your party trying to forget, but your party's going to be over. But when things that are higher and things that are nobler have allured your sight and you're hastening toward him, when as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that all that gaze upon him will be healed. And you look at him, you come to an awareness and you awaken to the reality that you are loved with a perfect love and your needs met. You know, and what happens when your need is met and you're embracing him, then you let go of all those things you cannot cling to forever anyway. I can't imagine anybody loving their wife more than I love mine. And what we've shared together for 37 years. And our children and our grandchildren. Those t-ball games is worship to me. Once those little old kids swing 14 times and finally hit that thing after knocking down the T-stand and, you know, and they finally hit it and the crowd's screaming, they run to third base instead of first and they're out in the the field throwing their gloves up in the air and they got to go relieve themselves. They don't, never mind the crowd, they just do it, you know. And They're so precious and those little old legs are just moving as fast as they can move them and they're barely going down the, the line and, and you know they'll stop the ball and everybody say yeah way to go and they just sit there and look at the ball where somebody else runs home and 
They're just like us. We're all that awkward with life. You know, and Father doesn't say, shame on you, you oughta. He knows without Him we can do nothing but make fools out of ourselves. And then we learn, we learn to focus on the coach, and we just accept His acceptance of us. And, you know, and now we're able to love because you can't love someone you're trying to possess. We can call it love, but it's not. My way was letting go, then our way became holding on. Girl, you know I hate to go and leave you here crying and all alone. But there comes a time in every life declared Independence Day because sooner or later, all lovers have a parting of the ways. The children we love so grow up overnight, it seems. But loved ones come and they go, reminding us of what freedom really means. Well, I'm not complaining nor claiming life's all that cruel, but sometimes it sure seems that way because sooner or later, all lovers have a parting of the ways. Now you keep on believing and loving and embracing Him, knowing we'll be together again One endless day. This life is but a season. And you and me share the same rhyme and reason. And an endless love who shines and shows us the way. So dry your eyes. You can smile and realize. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Come what may. When Jesus Christ is your first love, you know very soon there'll be no more parting of the ways. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, the key there is letting go of another person, insisting that they be your possession, calling it love. And that breaks the stronghold of jealousy, of anger, of disappointment, etc., etc. And now you can enjoy the company of people on a non-clinging basis because you're not looking to other people to give you what only Christ can. I had a dream uh, I was reminded of, and it was after coming to the Lord um, so many years ago, and and realizing, beginning to realize that he loved me when I hated me. And I was drawing conclusions about who I was based on my past behavior rather than based on his past behavior of dying on a cross for me. And when I began to awaken to the reality that I'm loved, I began to see what a curse I was in other people's lives insisting that this world turn my way and insisting that people act the way I think they ought to act and walking around offended and disappointed all the time because because uh, the world was not measuring up to what I thought it should be. I was deceived into thinking that I was the center of the universe like the rooster who thought the sun came up just to hear him crow. Then I had a dream one night after as a grown man coming to Jesus loves me this I know. And I was standing at a train station out in the bitter cold. There was no food. You know, it was something that you could imagine back, you know, years ago during World War II, maybe in in Russia uh, or parts of Europe where the Nazis had been through, you know, and everybody was terrified and, you know, and we didn't know where we were going to live or where we were going to eat and we were had all these these overcoats, but it was not enough to protect us from the bitter cold. We were all huddled together. It was it was agony. And a train, slow-moving train goes by. And I look away from my loved ones and my family, and I see on this train a conductor standing at the door holding his hand out. And for a moment, I forget the others. 
And I reach out and I grab that hand. And he pulls me into the car of the train. He sits me down on this very comfortable seat. He gives me something warm to eat, some warm soup, delicious. I start to drink some water to help with the dehydration, and I start to get some strength back. It's warm in there, so I'm able to get the coat off. He begins to wipe my forehead, and I am so grateful. And as I'm starting to feel better, I think, oh, my God, my wife, my children, my grandchildren, my friends, they're still out there. I got to go get them. And I run toward the door, and I just before I jump out, he grabs me, and he says, listen to me. Don't leave this train to go get them. Offer them your hand. But if they will not take your hand, don't you jump off the train because this train's picking up speed and you won't be able to get back on it. Have you found solid ground and everybody around you seemingly is drowning? If you try to be their savior and jump in there to save them, you're going to drown with them. What have you accomplished then? There's only one who can save us. I can't take his hand for my wife or for my son or for my grandchild. I can only take his hand for me. He's a personal savior. Now, we are around this on a daily basis, happening multiplied times of desperate mothers and dads and wives and husbands calling on behalf of someone else. Can they get into your program? Can they, would you go see them in jail? Would you do this? I've just, I've just retained a lawyer, thousands of dollars for a lawyer. And God is trying to get my loved one to the end of the rope. I just keep giving them rope because I think they're mine and I'm trying to be their savior. And I spend thousands. I lose the farm because I'm trying to I'm trying to save my child rather than let my child go. And you know why I won't let my child go? Because I don't believe God. Lady called me yesterday. She says, my grandson needs a place to go. My grandson. He got on drugs. Now, he's raised in church. He knows how to live. He knows right. He knows how to do right to be right. He doesn't know how to. He just knows what ought to is. He knows better than act like that. And all that kid's getting from his family. Shame on you. Shame on you. Shame on you. How could you hurt us this way? After we've loved you so much. And get mad and irritated. How could you steal from us to buy drugs? Well, that old devil's got my kid again. You know, when, the, when, when human beings started blaming the devil back in Genesis 3, Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the serpent. We better quit blaming anybody. You got a personal choice. You got to get on the train for you. And if baby won't come, give, come with you, why don't you just believe God to send the hounds of heaven and rescue baby? And baby may have to go to prison to get saved. Well, I tell you, 100 years from now, it's going to be here before you know it. 10,000 years from now, is going to be here before you know it. Where's baby going to be then? When mom and daddy was in God's way, stiff arming Jesus because my child is perishing. And you're perishing with them, trying to save them. It's called enabling. His mama and his daddy loved each other, and they loved their child. He grew up in a home of provision and care, and then he went off wild, shook his fist in the face of God, the pusher he wouldn't shove, sold his soul for holes in his arm. He trampled on love. He trampled on love. He trampled on love. He spit in the face of mercy and grace. He trampled on love. The family's torn apart. Heaven has a broken heart. Where can the healing start? He trampled on love. Well, it's so easy to point a finger of shame at the prodigal son and arrogantly accuse him of being the only one. But every time we worry or fear, every time we fail to forgive, 
we must first reject the Father and the love He freely gives. Unbelief calls God a liar and slanders His throne above. Unbelief is just another way we trample on love. We trample on love, we trample on love, we spit in the face of mercy and grace. We trample on love. The family's torn apart, heaven has a broken heart. Where can the healing start? We trample on love. Well, it won't be long till his fair-weathered friends are gone. It won't be long until he's left all alone. It won't be long until he longs for home. And there he will find a love that says, never mind that you trampled on love. No more trampling on love. No more trampling on love. No more spitting in the face of mercy and grace. No more trampling on love. The family's no longer apart. Heaven has a grateful heart. Here it is. Forgiveness is where the healing starts. No more trampling on love. How do I let go, of baby, and let God embrace baby? I've got to first let God embrace me. Because I wouldn't be possessing baby if I had it going on one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. My dear brother-in-law and friend passed away in his early 40s. Worked so hard to become a director of a major corporation and a millionaire before while he was in his 30s. Self-made, as we call it. We spent a weekend together, and then the next week, his wife called me at 2 a.m., and she said, Bill, I got up two hours ago to go to the bathroom and had a massive heart attack, fell over and died. And I thought, oh, how frail this life is. What really matters? I've got to come to terms with my own mortality, and you've got to do it for you. You say, I don't like to think about it. Well, you better. This could be your last day on the planet, and you're going to have to leave baby behind and anything else you possess and live for. Well, why don't you just go ahead and have your funeral and surrender in the arms of eternal love. And it's easy to let go of everybody and everything else when you let Christ embrace you. Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. And when you surrender all in the arms of His love, you're not afraid of losing anything anymore. Now you're free to live or physically die. And it's okay. And then an amazing thing happens. You have the capacity to call forth the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead on behalf of your loved ones. I wrote this after my friend, my brother-in-law, passed away. I was blessed so much to live with you. Our love was even better than I ever thought love could be. I watched you change through the sun and the rain erasing all the lonely feelings that were haunting me. But you had somewhere to go, and I do too, so we move on to our separate destinies. Because we never pushed and we never shoved, because true love is not a possessive kind of love. Oh, I've got to confess that I'll miss you, but love can't be possessive, though I wish you were still here. But instead of blaming God you're gone, I'll thank Him for the love we've known throughout the years. And I'll place this wreath upon your grave and let you go to the one who's calling you from above. Because we never pushed and we never shoved. True love is not a possessive kind of love. Now when I let go by letting Him embrace me, then I can pray effectively for you. I cannot take my idol to God and ask Him to bless it and get results. And my idol can be my child. My idol can be my child's recovery. But when I let go of all, not left with open arms, but filled with the Spirit of God and aware and vibrant, and energized, and inspired, and motivated. Father, that child is yours. 
send the angels after him. And you watch what happens. Take it from a dad who had two sons who were crystal meth addicts in and out of jail. No more. For years now, my best friends, two of them, I consider y'all some of the others. But a best friend is not somebody you cling to. A best friend is somebody you give to God. After you give yourself away to Him. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. This is Bob McLeod. If you'd like more information concerning Our Father's Arms, you can write us at Our Father's Arms, Post Office Box 1158, Jacksonville, Alabama, 36265. Or visit us on the web at www.ourfathersarms.org. May the Lord Jesus Christ continue to give us eyes to see the unseen. Amen. Love descending deeper than our feelings. And love expanding beyond our minds. Love transcending space and time. Jesus loves you. Do you know?